Thanks, Jim. Um, yeah, so I've been introduced, John Reedy, um, Head of Design System Operations. Probably the first question is, what is design system operations? Um, so I'm going to talk about the design system, and I'm going to talk about all the operating models around it. I'm also going to talk a little bit about the differences between DesOps and creative operations, which is, which is why we're all here. So I'm going to start with the basics. We've been around a while, um, over 150 years. I mean, I, sometimes I try and help put it in context by saying we started the same year the, the American Civil War ended. And the amount of stuff we've gone through and we're going through with epidemics, uh, cultural change, wars, etc., cetera, um, has shaped everything we've done over, the last, over that period. Um, obviously, major technical advancements are, have been in the past and obviously in the future as well. I mean, these guys here, if you look, have a look at them, I mean, um, we complain... We complain endlessly about our tooling, but these guys didn't even have telephones and they ran a big global bank. So for us, scale, scale's a big thing. So scale's huge. It's the biggest international bank. We've got huge amounts of staff. The revenue's, the revenue's huge as well. And you're, and you're dealing with, if you see on the left-hand side, you're dealing with so many different propositions, so many different um, internal functions, business lines, subsidiaries, etc. So lots of complexity, lots of sub-brands, subsidiaries. What, what, it, what comes with it is lots of ideas, lots of energy, and sometimes it's all about steering those ideas. So it's not about encouraging the fact that we need design thinking or things like that. It's about actually dealing with the amount of design thinking that we have in the bank and, and the amount of different ideas and the amount of different agencies we work with and the amount of different concepts and time periods that we have to deal with. So it's, it's a lot of it's about steering, articulating, auditing, and then, and, then, um, and then kind of leadership positions, really. So lots of potential for fragmentation, if done incorrectly, but lots of energy to scale with and to do great work. So it's just kind of loads of le Lego pieces to work with. So the bank um, did a global uh, rebrand around 18 months ago. Uh, that, that, that you may see uh, in, in lots of different places. Um, so we use that as, as a, uh, a great excuse to, to relaunch our whole design system and, and start building a platform to do that in. Because we felt we could kind of ride the coattails of that and it would give us the excuse we need and, uh, and the kind of impetus we need to kind of move ahead with that and get all the change we needed in place as well. So I'll show you, I'm gonna show you a short video that um, helps outline some of the work that we've done within the design system. Great design at HSBC starts well before we create a concept, place a pixel, or develop a delivery plan. HSBC's global digital design system was born out of the need for simplicity and modernity. It's a system whose purpose is to consistently guide our customers towards prosperity. It's made up of six components. Design language a common and modular design language that aligns HSBC's brand to its brand foundations, design guidelines, and implementation. Our system helps us solve the most complex design challenges in the financial world, but it's also easy to use. That's because it's evolved from strong foundations and been crafted by the hands and minds of people that'll use it. Community, a focal point for HSBC's design community that connects their creativity and experiences. Design thinking, a customer-centric model that guides the design process by defining key activities that ought to take place during a project. Review and alignment, design operations that support teams and business lines to evolve digital assets in line with guidelines. Measurement and performance, methodologies that help teams prove the effectiveness of products and designs using data, common analytic services and best practices. Tools. A common tool set that aligns HSBC's design community and practices while improving design output and efficiencies. HSBC's global digital design system is part of our design DNA and a signature of our customer commitment. It connects the tools our design community use and shapes every experience we serve our customers. Together, we thrive.
and um, you can't underestimate how much um, how how useful it is having a quick video that you can show people when you start a meeting and kind of explain a lot of concepts in a much better way than just driving through tons of slides, which I'm just about to do. <laughs> um, one of the one of the first things I wanted to explain was yeah the difference between or yeah the difference between maybe DevOps, which you might never have heard the term before, and creative operations. So we're kind of within digital design, and DevOps is a, is a huge thing for the last uh, last. Uh, couple of years. I think the way to explain it, yeah, I've kind of written it here. Everything that a designer would need in their daily job that isn't design. All the things that, um, and it's been talked about a lot in, this, um, in these presentations, but it's around the things that a designer has to do when they come in. They might do recruitment. They might need to get the tools working. What about this kind of paperwork they have to do? What about kind of, um, I mean, we have it a lot where we've got designers that that end up taking on management tasks, they become project managers, they start looking at budgets, about recru recruiting strategies, maybe we need a new system. You know, all of this stuff that stops them from designing. So everything that takes away from their, from their daily job of the work they're actually meant to be doing, um, we call it operations, so design operations. So um, within this, we talk about, uh, I mean, the first, well, the first thing I'd really say is you could take DevOps out of that and just think about the person. So that person or that team of, of creative individuals and everything that they need around it. So this is about kind of setting them up and giving them what they need to succeed. So if we think about culture, when we talk about culture, it's the kind of holistic view of, of, um, of values, principles, how we work together. They're kind of creative career paths. I'm, so I'm not going to read this out, but work-life balance and, and the morale um, that that brings. And, and it's the general maturity that you have from a design program. And it means that people will stay with you longer and, and, and do better work. You've got the processes, so you've got more of the kind of hard stuff, like, um, like workflows, you've got staff onboarding, things like uh, review and alignment and governance and things that kind of, that, that people need to be clear about how everything operates. And then you've got the ecosystem. So this is all of the things that you build around your design team. So their tooling, their technology, their design systems, You've got the company organ uh, organization around it and how, how they feel about that and how clear it is to them. And things like just overall infrastructure, so all the materials and the mechanisms they have in order to do their job properly. Uh, and the idea is if you can focus on these three areas and you could have percentage games, they will equate to better work, faster and happier teams. So we'll talk a little bit about those subjects. I'm gonna structure it like that. So uh, around culture, I want to talk about what we did really over the last couple of years in HSBC. Now, before we could really do anything, we had to build relationships. So where there was um, siloing and fragmentation and teams that didn't understand what other teams did, roles and responsibilities weren't clear, we had to kind of build those bridges and have some of those hard conversations. So um, trust is a big thing. The fact that you're not going to take their job away, the fact that your department isn't going to swallow up their department and that you're happy and respectful of what they do and you understand it and you want, and you want to work together and you stop breaking it down and, and, uh, and, and building the lines and making it clear how we're going to do that. And I think what, what we soon realised is that there wasn't really enough creative hierarchy. So when I, when I say that, it means there's, there was a lot of design resources, but they didn't have senior support around... They didn't kind of have a, a boss, and they didn't have someone that you could speak to or someone that was actually looking after a number of other, other designers or looking after an area and taking responsibility long-term over, over something, which was, which was massive for us to do, and it, and it was something quick that we could do. And there was times where um, the recruitment or the promotions weren't um, forthcoming, so what we had to do was actually um, find the right people, find the people that think in a systematic, positive way, and actually... Um, build those people up and help them. So even if it's not your team, to be honest, it's not your team, it's not your, your ability to do it, but yet you can spot people that are great and you can support them into being that person that you'd like them to be. And it, and it means that you can communicate much quicker, you can, have, you can make decisions in a much faster way because you can have 15 people out around a table that can make decisions across a whole bank rather than a 1,000 people with all the same voices, all of them. Um, and, and, and communication is basically impossible. And it also increases buy-in, because that's a massive one, because there's no point releasing 
new design language or new decisions or policies if no one's going to buy in and you're just going to have constant, you know, jumping, jumping back to the community. If you haven't got the buy-in and a relationship, when you get to the point of releasing um, new, new things, you're just going to get a lot of backlash. So it's about kind of building that up and that's how it's worked for us. I think when it comes to kind of working together, we, um, we focus a lot about uh, the design language in our um, in our bank, so our, my job. I've got Neil here with me today. We look at we look at the design language. We look at how it's how it's managed and how it's um, distributed and decided upon. So one thing that was really key for us is, as our teams have grown internally, the teams have become stronger and more mature, and they um, and they really know what they're doing. So I think before um, before previously it was it was a lot of work where you didn't have such strong internal teams. So more work would come. Um, from a central team and you would kind of output it and, and different agencies would use it because you'd have a different model. But what we've done over the last year is evolve that so all of our decisions are made at scale and we involve the right people. So what, what we've got here is a top-down model, top-down, bottom-up model. So what you, what you get from a bottom-up approach is you've got teams that are working on products, on journeys, with customers, spending more time at scale across the whole bank and they're, and they're coming up with um, new patterns, new designs that they need to action really quickly. And, that, and, and you're going to learn from those, like when they're, even though they're kind of um, spread out across the bank, you're going to learn from them and you're going to bring them up into the design language really quickly. But then you've also got a lot of strategic work where you have to curate it, you have to work with large groups of people. And obviously you learn so much as well. If you want, if you, when you've got all of this talent at your disposal, you want to use it. There's no point having all of these great people around in all of these different areas and then you go and ask someone over here to make the decision, not tell them about it. So it's about making those decisions together and then rolling them out. Again, nothing's, nothing's perfect and we've done our best and it's not plain sailing right now and it's all, it's all still a, a good trajectory. But I'd say the biggest... Um, challenge that anyone will always have with, with any of these processes we've discussed today is a human ego. And I would say we all have one. You know, I'm on a stage right now talking to hundreds of people and um, I have one myself. I find it hard, um, and the, depending on how big the company is, you find it even harder to make a mark. So I think we talked a lot about, and even in some of the conversations I've been having, we found that kind of that mix between being creative and that kind of magic inspiration that we've heard Mark and Paddy kind of denounce really in the morning, which was, which was nice, that kind of creative inspiration, let's protect it. And then some people may feel systematic approach is kind of, um, is, is anti that. And um, so what you're trying to make the mark, uh, you're, tr you're trying to make your mark and you're trying to, um, you're trying to explain um, to everyone kind of how, how talented you are. And, and it's really hard to deal with because if everyone kind of had their own marks all over the place, it, would, it just kind of creates a bit of a mess. So how, how we deal with it, and do our best to deal with it, is, is try to explain how important our overall system is and what we're trying to achieve globally uh, and, what, and what it's doing for all of us. And we encourage them to put down the kind of small kind of ownerships that they have on, in different areas and actually like, um, jump in with us and actually own this system together. So we try and share and make sure credit is credit is given throughout because it's really important that people can make a mark and that they can perceive obviously their jobs are on the line people's promotion on the line they want to be able to prove themselves and you have to you have to allow for that and you have to encourage people and and share the credit share the ownership basically so I'll talk a little bit about our ecosystem which again is about the materials and the infrastructure that we have in place for our design teams and, we're, and where we're going so in December we launched our new um, platform for brand and design system, which um, which we're really proud about. And it took um, took over a year's worth of work, and um, we're really one of the reasons we're really proud of it is because it's it's bringing all of marketing and digital design together in one place. And obviously, that's that's never really an easy thing because it's kind of two worlds meeting, which is um, which is which is exciting but also quite difficult. Um, but, we're, but we had the shared objective of having a kind of one-stop shop where whether you're building an app or whether you're rolling out a kind of out-of-home out of um, out marketing campaign, you can go to one place and you can understand the whole thing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and what we've done. So when we say design language, for, for everyone that kind of isn't working in digital at the moment, our, our design language is, is our documentation 
and it's the code that goes with it, and it's, um, it's all of our guidance for, um, for people building digital products. And when we started the process of building our new design language, we looked at, we looked at pretty much every other design language in the, in the world, anyone, anyone good really. We looked at um, BBC's Gel, IBM's Carbon, we looked at Material, we looked at Fluent, Lightning, and, and if, any, any other kind of, <laughs> any other verbs you can hear, think of. And um, there's just so much out there to learn. It's such a, um, it's such a new area, really. It's, it's that kind of probably that next level of digital transformation. And we looked at what kind of information you get at each point. You know, are people sharing code? Uh, are they in a logged in environment? Is it public? Is it internal? Are they, um, can you download different technologies? Can you um, download sketch files that have lots of kind of great content in there? And also from a platform point of view, uh, are people allowing communications? Are they allowing people to chat through each pattern and kind of discuss it? Exactly what's happening here. So we looked at every, um, everything out there. We looked at the platforms um, and, um, and we decided on, on quite a few decisions, which, are, which was really, really helpful. I would do that. There's no point trying to reinvent the wheel when you can look at everyone else and do a great bit of research. And we used design thinking when we were actually building that. So we looked at things like um, animations, where obviously we're, we're, we're a huge kind of company and we, um, we're across 80 different countries. So language is always a problem. We looked at, we looked at um, how much information we actually provide, because the more information you provide in huge documents, the, more, the, well, the less anyone's going to read them and, and the more they're going to miss. So one of the things that was a real breakthrough over the last, say, year to 18 months was not only giving people um, all of your design documentation, but also giving people downloadable files and assets they could use. So, so we have um, design toolkits. So I know toolkits are a kind of overstated word, I notice at the moment, but our, our design toolkits are sketch-based files that are that basically act as stencils. So within each program, because um, as I said earlier, we're... we're we're really big and we have lots of different programs, lots of different sub-brands and subsidiaries around. And you have to give a degree of flex. So with our, with our sketch files, we, have, um, we try and build them into each program. Um, in, our, in each sketch file they have, I'm gonna just play a video to kind of show you how we construct things. But each, this is, a, this is our mobile app for retail. So if you're a HSBC customer, you're probably gonna be getting something like this very soon. It shows how designers can, um, different, so we've got, I think on average, well, we're thinking around a thousand UX and UI designers globally. Now, some of them are really senior, they know what they're doing, and they want to kind of break boundaries and do new things and, and, and vision work. Other ones just want things that they can roll out journeys with. And they want to be able to build that new, that version of the app in Mexico. They want to, they want to build something in Singapore. They want to build it quickly sometimes, and they don't have a lot of time or budget. And what we have here is a, a sketch-based system that has... If you think of it, it's kind of paint by numbers to a degree, because when, sometimes you do need to roll out things very quickly. But imagine all of this grows, and, and, and each week what we do is we encourage new patterns to go in, any new ideas evolve, they get added to the system, and everyone knows what they're doing, basically. And it's, and it's, and it's changed the way we govern, and it's changed the way our designers kind of feel about the whole process. And it means that from a technology point of view, we match everything we're doing um, to these patterns, we make sure it's, it's much easier to govern. We can make, um, accessibility is absolutely huge for us, and it means that our accessibility guys can see everything that's happening. The, um, our technology guys can see everything that's happening, so decisions are much, much more e easily controlled. Um, I'm going to talk about how this is distributed as well, because one of the things from a tooling point of view is how do you manage... Um, the banks are quite are notorious for having um, huge security um, restrictions, and when it comes to tools and plugins and technology is always much harder to do. Um, but this is something that we can focus on to, to help with that. So I showed you kind of from a design point of view, and one thing we're spending even more time this year about is looking at um, development libraries. So again, like I said in the earlier slides, we've got a lot of everything. We've got a lot of dev libraries for every kind of technology you can imagine. Some of them are more organized than other ones. But what we're doing now is we're not, we're not trying to build another one. We're trying to find out what we have, audit it, certify it, and actually um, give it the credit it needs, make sure people share it, make sure people use it, and actually help it. And act. If you can certify a library, it means that 
it means that you can trust it. So I think a lot, you've got so many tools, but if the trust isn't there, if, it hasn't, if you haven't gone through the process of certifying something and trusting it and making sure that it can be used as a sign of process, it doesn't have the same value. So you're kind of, you've got all these great tools, but you're ignoring it in the workflow in regards to sign off, et cetera, then it's, then it, then it, then it really not making the most of it. So our last, the last section I was gonna we'll talk about in, in this part is around process. So design thinking is, um, is a is a is a huge thing for us, and it's something that um, that some areas of the bank do really well, and other areas have never heard of. And we've got lots of different models. Well, we did have lots of different models um, to to kind of cater for this. Lots of different agencies and um, lots of different management consultancies have helped us with this. Um, but now we're now we're moving towards a single model. We're actually doing an update on this now. This is more of an all encompassing model. So it starts with scoping and aligning. Obviously, it does discovery, definition, design and testing. You've got your create, you've got your, um, you've got your um, create and implement, and then you're into measure and optimize. So a lot of our products are um, um, iterative products, so large products that go on for a number of years, and they'll probably go on for a number of years more. So we're talking about iterating and making sure people are doing things at the right times. I mean, what happens naturally in, in most organizations, including ours more previously than now, is that people start with, they think they understand the problem without talking to a customer. They, don't, they feel like that discovery is a waste of time. They can jump straight, you've got a product owner that can jump straight into design and test. They go into implementation and then they forget about it and then they're on to the next product. And then three years time they kind of look back at it and they go, oh yeah, what was, well, why, is, why isn't this performing? So really what we're trying to do is get them to focus on doing that right amount of discovery and definition, defining the problem and doing the research up front, and then also measuring and optimizing what you've done and keep going with it. Stay on that project and iterate it and learn from it. Use the data, keep making it best. Don't kind of leave it there, throw it away and start again. Um, from a review and alignment point of view, because I did mention quite quickly at the beginning that we had, in one of the slides, that we had, we've got over 2,000 projects that go through digital every every year. So that kind of comes through our team. And that includes ATM projects, apps, websites, um, and other kind of smaller things like WeChat and things like that in, in China. Um, and when we say a project, it could be um, a new feature, it could be a journey, or it could be something much bigger. We have um, this four-step process, and we're very strict because obviously we take um, risk and compliance um, very seriously, legal, etc. And we start with a kickoff. So number one is your, your kickoff. You kind of have to, um, you approach the governance team or we approach you and you say, okay, we've got, we've got a new project. We put it onto the radar for the bank. We then work with the teams from, and this could be in an agile way from a feature by feature process, or this could be kind of a more waterfall and kind of we go through the whole process together as a single action. But it's, um, it's about working with, um, working with designers to make sure the experience is right, the UX, the UI, it, and copy, et cetera, is correct. We then go into a build review. We make sure the build is correct, um, and, it, and it's as, as, as we've signed off previously. And then, and then we go for a project approval. Because the amount of projects, like 2,000 a year that are going through, there's just so much capability to, if you've got some money, you can just go live with a product in a particular country. So we, we rely on this strongly. It's basically the lifeblood or, and that connected process that, that goes from start to finish. So I'm gonna end with talking a little bit about um, where we're moving to. So looking ahead, um, we've heard brief mentions of AI in some of these talks today, and it's a, and it's a big part of everything that we're looking, um, looking at in the future. I think from an AI point of view, it's interesting to think about how it's going to affect all of our lives. And you've probably read lots of articles and everyone's got a view on it. But I think what's safe to say is that the, the removal of labor-intensive, repetitive tasks is a bit of a no-brainer. That's definitely going to happen. So if you imagine when that's going to, when, when that's going to take effect in, in, in each of your workflows, I think it's definitely going to happen. Um, it's the, I think the use of data is going to be powerful as well. The amount of, the way you can use AI to kind of measure and then output reports really quickly is going to have a huge effect. But then again, a lot of people have said today, it's, it's reallocating time from admin tasks, boring, rep repetitive tasks, into creativity. 
And it's also thinking about what, not only does it kind of free up time for you to be more creative in what you're currently doing, it changes the way you're creative and it gives you way more power. So I'm going to speak about that in a minute. But first of all, I'm going to talk about a um, project we lovingly call uh, Robot Chicken. And um, I mentioned previously about this review process, the amount of, the amount of people that are involved, the, um, the amount of um, thousands of projects that go through. Well, I, I did have a slide previously on the, on the process it takes, but it does take a number of days. Now, we've, um, we've been looking at how AI can help review our work so designers can actually use it to support, um, use it to kind of self-govern what they're doing and, and give them kind of self-support. So this is a tool we're working on at the moment and we're looking to launch this year. And it's a tool that um, allows designers to upload their work. They can upload, they can use it within the tools that they have and they can also um, do it um, through URLs. And what it does is that it's a system that uh, on the left-hand side is what you see is the, is the kind of Frankenstein design that we've placed up there with tons of different design components. What you see on the right-hand side is 70 different kind of recognition points within that design where they've recognized, um, where, where the system's recognized uh, buttons and calendars, it's understood copy, it's looked at the logo, it's looked at how, how many buttons are on the page. Because we've got rules like we need a single, we, we only allow one primary CTA on a, on a particular page. So what it does is not only does it recognize the primary CTA and make sure it's correct, it also checks the fact there is only one primary and there isn't multiple ones and they haven't used. So it's kind of those extra relationships that, that we're working on at the moment. And what, the, what the, the user gets is a report back that tells them all the things that they need to change in order to bring them in line with our design language and our, and our, and our standards. And obviously, you can imagine where this is going to go and all of the different, and all the different checks it can do on copy, on legal, um, um, on accessibility, et cetera. So this is kind of where we're, where we're moving to. Um, and it's the data you get as well. So one really, really exciting bit for this is, is understanding, um, understanding more about our design community. Because we mentioned, let's say we've got, a, we've got 800 internal designers and we've got external agencies. So understanding how many of them are getting it right, how many of them understand our standards, have even heard of our standards, have even, um, and are our standards correct? Are they, are they not paying attention? Is it us not communicating properly? Can we reach out to them? Can we help them with training? Can we speak to their bosses about it? And, and, and understanding and, and thinking about kind of overall design quality, filtering by country and understanding, what, um, understanding where we need to position ourselves and what we need to work on. And also what's, um, if we're projecting our growth of our design language and what things we need to focus on, it helps us um, understand where, where we need to head and where, how we need to prioritize. What I did from a business case point of view, we, a lot of us talk about buy-in, I think, that today. What I did with, with, was just throw some numbers together with, some, with a very quick survey from our design community. First we, kinda, first, we had to work out how many designers we have, because that's not understood. It's just too big. No one really knows how many designers HBC have. And then you've got um, the amount of time we feel that they're looking at, I mean, we call them standards, but how much time they're looking at uh, our design language. How much, oh, yeah, how does that button work again? How does that drop down work? Going back to the website, reading about it, downloading the things, maybe speaking to someone else. And then you've got all the time that you're spent in meetings. And we do a lot of review meetings and support meetings where we say, hey, let's have a look at your work. And if you're not really thinking about what you're doing, Basically what happens is you end up just looking at every page. So traditionally we look at every page that comes through, look again and again. Okay, here's 50 pages. You do, an, you do another app, comes through next week, do it, do it again. So if you're not really thinking about what you're doing, you start to spend a huge amount of effort on that. So this is about even kind of bringing these numbers down a bit. You can imagine, I mean, I've, I've had to block it out, but you can imagine there's huge numbers there and it is running into the millions and how much, um, how much time you're gonna save there. Um, so from an AI, from a, well, I call it our AI journey, and when we kind of originally started strategizing what the technology would give us, I mean, it's safe to say that um, where we're at now in our journey is around alignment. So if you teach, it's kind of like teaching um, the AI system about, about a film. So it can, critique, it can critique the film. It can kind of tell you, ah, oh, this plot line didn't make sense. You know, that, that metaphor of, of understanding, it can understand enough to tell you what's wrong with your design. But where we're going to is once you teach, once you teach the bot what's wrong, 
how everything works, what all the rules are, using machine learning as well, it means that you can start thinking about creation. You can start thinking about, if, you, if it, obviously this is where you jump to really, you think if you, if you know how this web page is constructed and you know the rules around how journeys are constructed and you're pulling in data from different successful projects, et cetera, you can start to think about creatively, what can I try? Let's, let's, I've got a great idea for a new product. I want to try it like this, but let's get 10 versions. Let's get 10 versions, let's try them out. So the power in your creativity, your output, could be maximized in a, in a massive way. Um, so I'm going to end on this slide. If we go back to um, the three areas I discussed, culture, process, and ecosystem, I think everything within those areas is going to change. You know, Our ways of working are going to change. Our technologies are going to change. Our tooling is going to change. But I think that the effort that we put into the actual designer and the design team that, and the, and the, the non-design, the people that we're working with, I think that isn't going to change. And it always has to be an ongoing focus. Thank you.